Good to have you all here. Glad you guys are with us for the first time. And uh, Gabriel is a pastor, right? What's that? Evangelist. That's great. So we're glad to have you in a unique way. You're at, you're at a table with some, some high-level guys there. So uh, straighten them out. Bring them to Jesus, all right? But we're glad you're with us today. Well, guys, we're glad all of you are here. And we continue this morning our series in the book of what? Joshua. We're reading through and studying through quickly Joshua. But, of course, all of you have read it already, so you know where we are and where we're going. Oh, my goodness. i got to introduce one other person I just saw, Kevin Dupree. Kevin, stand up. Kevin used to be a member of Forge and is back with us for the first time in a long time. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Uh, all right, all right. Well, at, at, at Forge, we are about building great men as God defines greatness, and we know that that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Can't start until that really begins to happen. And so uh, we are about building uh, God's men. And, and we have five marks of biblical manhood that we talk about, identity, purpose, character, confidence, and uh, that leads to legacy, leaving the proper legacy. Well, at the men's retreat with Willow Creek this past weekend, one of the guys was asking me, what, what, what is the different dimensions? And I walked through some of that with him. And as we talked about purpose, of course, identity starts out first. We are God's deeply beloved, redeemed sons. It's all because of Jesus. That's our identity. That will never change in all time and eternity. Identity is the question, answers the question, who are we? Well, then the next thing is purpose. What is our purpose? Well, purpose answers the question, why are we here? What are we doing? And we said that uh, the Bible gives us three major purposes. We're leaders, worker providers, and, and what? Warrior ambassadors of Jesus Christ. He said, unpack the warrior thing for me. Uh, you know, and I, and I, you know, because I really want to draw a little blood sometimes. No, he said, that's harder to get my head around. Uh, and as we talked about warrior, we talked about the reality that God is always on the move. That's the theme of Joshua. God is on the move. He's always on the move, uh, advancing his kingdom, bringing good news to people. And that's even in the Old Testament time. But the reality is, that is a part of our work as well. Exodus 15.3 says, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. And so we get to be a part of advancing the kingdom of God. And when you enter into a conversation with somebody about truth, uh, aren't you entering into a battle? Yes, you are. <laughs> You start talking about Jesus, you start talking about Jesus being the way, the truth, the life, the only way, you're entering into some significant battles, and there's a lot of pushback that comes from that. So we are at point as warriors spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Somebody sent me a picture of a couple um, at uh, ordering um, at, in a restaurant, and they got the ladies got the menu, they got smiles on their faces, and... They're all happy that they're in a restaurant. And the girl says to the waitress, she says, we don't eat eggs, meat, fish, dairy, or gluten. What would you recommend? And the waitress says, a taxi. <laughs> uh, uh, leave. I mean, some people are against everything, it seems. And have you ever explained something from the Bible and, and, and you've seen their facial um, expressions change toward you where they say, you really believe that? And, and truth, truth, you see, truth is, 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 a, is a commodity today that is rarely found. And what we're finding is we're finding a lot of pushback when it comes to truth. Um, Lenin said this, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. A lie told often enough becomes the truth. And sometimes when we tell the truth, people's head just kind of goes... They can't believe it, that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And so it's important for us to understand that we are in a war as we tell truth to people around us because so many people don't want to hear the truth. 
All right, so now in Joshua, today we're going to look at two chapters pretty, pretty quick. Uh, because you've already read it, right? Yeah, you've already read it. But um, I want to unpack these two chapters where the war gets even hotter. We have already had the war for Jericho and the war for Ai, uh, but now we're going to see a central uh, battle that takes place in the central part of Canaan, then go south, and then will eventually go north. That's how they won the promised land. But the, the war is going to get hot, and it's going to get bloody, and uh, it's important for us to remember uh, that this that the Israelites at this point of literal conflict, so when I say that we're in a war when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not saying draw your switchblade and cut their throats if they don't accept Christ. I'm not saying that, right? You know that. But in this battle, there was blood to be shed because the Israelites were the judicial arm of God in Canaan in this situation. And it brings up two points that are very important about judgment uh, as this war gets started. And I just want you to know that, number one, it's important for us to understand that God is using Israel to judge, to be the judicial arm of God's judgment for the rebellion and sin of the Canaanites. And this raises an important point that we need to keep in mind as men following Christ today, and that is that judgment of God is not just at the end of the age. Read Revelation, read Matthew 24. There is a coming judgment, a final judgment. The separation of the sheep and the goats, Jesus talks about, and Revelation. There is a final judgment. However... The Apostle Paul makes an interesting point in the Corinthian letters. He said, today is the day of salvation. And it's important for us to keep in mind that God can judge anybody for, eternal, for eternity at any time. And that, this brings an urgency for us sharing the gospel, doesn't it? Because we never know when someone is going to face their maker. After death comes judgment. You must receive Christ in this life. And so it's important for us to understand that this is, that what Israel is doing here is they're bringing about the judgment of God. And judgment is not just at the very end of the age. It could be at any time that God so chooses to bring it. However, this judgment that we see, and the second introductory point here, is this judgment that we see of Israel upon the Canaanites is a foreshadowing of the final judgment. This is a foreshadowing of the final judgments that we see in the book of Revelation. And this is important for us as men following Christ today to remember that we are truth tellers, gospel givers, good news proclaimers, right? And we need to do it because you never know when somebody else has the chance. Today is the day of salvation. I love the story of uh, little Billy. Little Billy was an only child, an only child for a long time. Uh, and finally, the mom and dad had another another uh, little baby girl, and uh, they brought the baby sister into the family, and everything changed. And, and finally, after a while, the dad said to Billy, he said, Billy, our house is too small for all of us, and we have to move. And Billy said, it's too late. She's walking pretty good now, and she'll probably just follow us. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> that's a good joke. It's not a bad joke. It illustrates how easy it is for us to think that we're the center of the universe and that it's all about me, it's a, but it's not. The gospel is about us, but it also is about those people that need to know Jesus. And so this whole judgment thing makes us a little bit bigger in our picture for other people. All right, I got a slide here. I want to show you the three things I want you to be able to, to get that will benefit you hopefully from this text today. Uh, this text, and I'm going to unpack it pretty quickly, and you can talk about it around your table. This text will help us be ready for the deception that is out there. Uh, secondly, to give us uh, the challenge that we've got to make important decisions, good decisions in this life, and then to gear up for prolonged battles until Jesus Christ comes back again. All right, look at your outlines. Here we go. First of all, I want you to note the cold battle for survival 
uh, the deception that will come to all of us. And Joshua and the Israelites faced that deception in Joshua 9. I'm going to read verse 1, uh, just a few verses here. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland along the coast of the great sea toward the Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. If you can't say that when you're reading it in a small group Bible study, just do it fast. And they'll think, wow, this guy knows his Hebrew. And just say it as fast as you can. When they heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. So Joshua's coming up with all of his troops, and everybody sees that they're coming. Jericho and Ai has been dealt with, and now uh, they're coming after other people. But, well, let me give you a map, because you see, here we see the strategy of how they're going to take the, 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 the promised land. They're going to divide the country in half, and then they're going to go south, and then they're going to do a turnaround and go north, and that's how they conquered the country uh, of Canaan, or the land of Canaan. And, and a brief, uh, I'll give you a brief geography lesson next week so you understand Israel a little bit better. But, uh, but, but the whole, all of these tribes saw all of these hordes of Israelites coming. I mean, people traveled a lot over there. They didn't have cars, but they traveled. And they saw the hordes coming. Now, verse 3 says this. Now, look for the Do you see the city? Well, back up one second to the map. Do you see Gibeon up there? There's Jericho. There's Ai. And up a little further is a city called Gibeon. Okay? Keep them in mind because when I read now, this is what comes next. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went out and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn and mended with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes and all of their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him, to the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country. So now... Make a covenant with us. These guys, these the Gibeonites, uh, came to Joshua's camp. You get the picture, don't you? They're right there. They're right in the hill country of the central part uh, of Canaan. Uh, but they figure, we cannot win this battle. There is no way uh, we are going to win this battle. So they came to them with all of the, they came to them and they came with deception in mind to fake them out. And, uh, and, and, and you can read the rest of the account. It's just really fascinating. Um, uh, at the end of three days of talking to Joshua and his men and his leaders, at the end of three days, Joshua made a covenant with them. Now remember, a covenant is a sacred relationship with somebody else. You don't just break a covenant. Remember how God set the covenant with Israel, with Abraham? He cut the animals in half. Why do you cut animals in half? And in ancient covenants, both people walk through that. Why do you cut the animals in half? Because you're making a statement as both people walk through those cut up animals that if anyone violates the covenant, there will be severe consequences. What happened to those animals will happen to you. So a covenant's a big deal. By the way, as a sub note, when God made the covenant with Abraham, where's Abraham? He's sitting on the side over here in a semi-stupor, and God, represented by the flaming uh, fire pot, walks through this covenant alone, showing that the covenant of grace that God makes with us is a it is a unilateral covenant dependent upon him only. It's a covenant of grace for us that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ uh, and, 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 and in his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's a powerful picture. But Joshua makes a covenant with these guys. And then it was only after several days that somebody said, you know, we probably ought to go check this out. And they followed these dudes back, and they found out that Gibeon was right around the corner, just over the hill, and that they had been sucker-punched 
into this covenant relationship. Now, let me ask you this. Were the Gibeonites, Gibeonites right to make a, a relationship with Joshua uh, to try to, to, were they logical? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? And the fear of God was put in them, and they made a right decision as pagans to try to deceive the people of God. Uh, so, so, I mean, look, look at all that Israel had done. They'd escaped the Egyptians. They'd crossed the Red Sea. Uh, the Egyptian army was in shambles. Then they'd crossed the Jordan River. They had two million people. I mean, are, yeah, you're not going to win this battle. Um, so the, the Gibeonites were legitimate uh, in, in doing this from a pagan perspective. What's the truth? The truth is, pagans are all around us, and pagans will be pagans. Should Joshua have been surprised that they would try to deceive him? He shouldn't have been surprised. Are we sometimes surprised? Are we sometimes surprised when people do things to us? And go, I'm so shocked that he would have done that to me. And there's unbelievers that do stuff all the time. Now, guys, one of the big lessons here is pagans will be pagans. You say, we live in a Christian country. Well, uh, correction? We live in a post-Christian country with the Judeo-Christian values uh, that were once inculcated through the Constitution in our laws have been systematically undone and are continuing to be systematically undone. And we've never lived in a country where 100% of the population were born-again believers. You know that, don't you? Do we live in a country that's defined by Christianity? Yes, historically. Now, think about all your relationships. Should you have wisdom and should you expect deception with everybody you deal with, with anybody you hire? With <laughs> That sounds kind of cynical, doesn't it? No, it's just being rational from a biblical perspective. Understand that pagans will be pagans and they seek to deceive uh, and, the, and, the, and the Gibeonite plan is brilliant in its simplicity. These guys... And, you know, evil is, uh, evil is brilliant in its simplicity a lot of times. And evil always has the first advantage because it's always willing to do the unthinkable to the unsuspecting. And oftentimes, we are the unsuspecting because we believe that people are basically good, don't we? What does the Bible teach? Are people basically good or are people basically bad, and sometimes do good. That one. Because we're born fallen sinners, and the Bible tells us to understand that those little babies that you give birth to, they are precious and sweet little depraved sinners who need Jesus. And the earlier the better. And it's important to understand that we're not born good, we're born sinners with Adamic sin, and if a, a person doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they still have continual sin that they have inherited through Adam, and they need a Savior. And so we can expect the unconverted to do the unthinkable. And Joshua didn't ask the questions, but the main thing he did not do is he did not seek the Lord for wisdom. Read chapter 9. He did not pray about it. He did not seek God's wisdom. You and I need to pray. Bishop taught on prayer two weeks ago, right? We need to pray about our relationships, about our business dealings, about everything we do. We need to pray for God's wisdom to guide us. We need the Holy Spirit to show us uh, the potential dangers. Uh, we need to know how to vote. James 4, 3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly that you may spend it on your pleasure. Guys, the first thing we need to understand as we look at this, this text of Joshua chapter 9 is that deception is everywhere. Beware, beware. And in Christ, we have the resources of the Holy Spirit to give us guidance, to, to, to seek wisdom from other men, to seek it from the word of God. Uh, to make good decisions. And so it's important to understand the cold battle is all around us. But then, secondly, notice on your outline, the hot battle for central Canaan gets going. In Joshua chapter 10, uh, the war goes hot here. By the way, Plato, uh, the philosopher, said it well 
Only the dead have seen the end of war. Were you shocked that Ukraine was invaded? No, I wouldn't either. I mean, you know, World War II was the war to, or World War I was the war to end all wars. And then just a few years later, uh, there was World War II. Uh, and then there was Korea. And then there was Vietnam. And then in my life, there's been constant war. Uh, someone said, I think that there's only been 280 years of peace in the last 3,400 years of human existence. That's about 8% of the time there's been peace. Maybe. And so in a broken world, in a fallen world, we understand that war is uh, unfortunately a continual thing. And in Joshua 10, uh, we see this uh, heating up. I, I love this. As soon as Adonai Zedek, the, uh, uh, the king of Jerusalem, heard about how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, due to Ai and its kings, as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon <laughs> had made peace with Israel and were among them. He noticed that Gibeon had allied with Israel and now Gibeon is his target. He feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city. Interesting. Like one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jarmuth, and Japhia, king of Lachish. Uh, that's Dan Lashish's hometown there in Israel. Right, Dan? Right. Right, you're a pagan, descendant of a pagan warrior. There we go. Uh, and to, I'm kidding there, I'm kidding there, but it might be true, I don't know. Uh, and to Deber, king of Eglon, saying, come up to me and help me and let us strike Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then, then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem. See, the Amorites are sometimes called Canaanites. Sometimes Canaanites are called Amorites. But they all band together and they say, let's go after Gibeon. But because Israel had made a relationship with Gibeon, what is Joshua now responsible to do? He is now responsible to defend Gibeon. And so, uh, and so Joshua has to go up and fight this conglomeration of warriors of city-state kings that have gathered together to fight against Israel. Joshua, you see, you make a bad decision, and a bad decision creates another bad uh, situation, doesn't it? That's why it's so much better for us to take all the effort to make a good decision. If you don't take the time to make a good decision, when are you going to have the time to clean up uh, the bad decision, and then finally make a good decision. Uh, and, and bad decisions always have consequences. Trust me, I have a history of that. And uh, God is finally teaching me in my dotage how to make better decisions. And I'm still, still struggle with that. But the reality is Joshua's stuck with this, and now he's got he's to change his battle plans a little bit, go up against these five kings. But fortunately, the Lord is with Israel because the ultimate warrior of Israel is God. God is fighting for his people. Verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I've given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly. I love this. Having marched up all night from Gilgal, it reminds me of the Battle of the Bulge uh, when uh, Patton said, hey, we got to get up there and stop the Germans. And he marched the German, the, the American army, the third army, up to Bastogne and, and was able to stop the German bulge uh, in their last effort to defeat the Allies. Uh, Joshua marched all night. Patton, by the way, was a reader of the Bible. He might have got it from this text. Marched all night. The Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent to Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekah and Machidah. And as they fled before Israel while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Who is, the, who is the warrior of Israel? Ultimately, God is. Who is your warrior ultimately that will go before you and me in the battles that we have to face in life? It is ultimately God, and we need to remember that. God killed more people here than the Israelites did with the sword. 
And in order to finish the battle, he, he did a miracle. Uh, in, in, in verse 12, it says, Sun stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ahalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. Hot war, a miracle, because God is the warrior of Israel, and remembering that he's bringing justice to these pagan, evil Canaanites who sacrifice their children to their gods. But also, he's creating a land from which the Messiah could come to save the world. The second Joshua is Jesus, who would be our Savior. This land was to be ground center for that. The rest of chapter 10 is an interesting uh, story. Uh, the five kings run like crazy. They're captured. They're thrown in a cave, kept there till the battle was over. Then they were brought out. And Joshua asserts his leadership. How old is Joshua at this point? 85. <laughs> you imagine Joshua, 85-year-old guy, cutting the heads off these dudes? He did. And I think that probably got the attention of his younger warriors. Um, he captured it. Fighting and war is, uh, is disturbing, isn't it? If anybody likes actual combat, I mean, there are a few guys that actually do, I suppose, but, but most people who like actual combat are traumatized by it. I bet these Israeli soldiers had some PTS in years to come. I really believe they did. I believe training for war makes a man a better man, but actual involvement in war uh, is, is often very difficult because the bloody... Conflict is disturbing at a deep, deep level. I think some of these warriors woke up in the middle of the night with uh, bad dreams, uh, with, 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 with the horror of the warfare that they had to experience. And sometimes we don't enter into the right kind of battles because even with unbelievers to talk about Jesus because we're afraid of the conflict. I get that. I like a good theological discussion. I like to tangle with a good pagan. I've been trained for that. It's a lot of fun for me. Fortunately, I don't have to cause any blood. But I get also that it's traumatic to interact with somebody over the basis of truth and error when they push back on you and you don't feel you're trained to do it. War, war is difficult. The most important Thing a man can take into combat is the reason why you're there. For the physical warrior, but also for the spiritual warrior. Why enter into a truth battle with anybody? Why tell them that Jesus is, in fact, the only way? I see those coexist bumper stickers. You see them? I'm, yeah, we should coexist. We shouldn't fight each other. However, on the basis of truth and gospel presentation, at some point we have to say to the Buddhist, you know, you need, you need to believe in God, and Jesus proves that God exists. We, we need to say to those of other faiths, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And your way is not the right way. There's only as we talk about political issues or social issues, there's only two genders. We have to push back. We have to say that government is not responsible for developing my children. I am. We have to, we have to say these things. You know, we, we have to enter into battle. And it's disturbing, but we are warriors who are called to do that, and it's for their good. The reason why is that they would know the Savior, because existence in error leaves them vulnerable to the judgment of God. If I care about pagans, I will tell them the truth as kindly as I can, and I will combat their arguments as best I can, but they must know the way and the truth and the life is Jesus. And it's got to be us. And it's got to be you men. You know, you guys get places that ministers don't get anymore. It used to be that pastors and ministers 
had influence in culture. No longer. Businessmen have much more influence out there than any of us. And, and so our job is to equip. Well, uh, Joshua 10 ends up with the third point, prolonged battles for the southern Canaan. And we could go on and on and on. I could list all this. Joshua, the rest of Joshua 10, verses 29 through 43, is really a list, a really a list of, of them saying, all right, we got this Gibeon thing taken care of, and now we got to go south. And they go city to city to city. And reading the rest of Joshua 10 is, is, just, is just the same wordage over and over from Libna to a city, to the next city, to the next city, to the next city. And you know, it's, it's, it's not sexy stuff. It's not fancy stuff. It's just putting one foot in front of the other and, and not innovating on the plan of God, but just bringing the plan of God to these people, which was judgment. And so a lot of times we want innovation, we want new stuff, we want great stuff, but the reality is the battles until Jesus Christ comes back is a prolonged battle, it's just a long battle, of God's sovereign power and our responsibility involved in extending the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And you guys are crucial and at point. And the warriors in the hand of the living God who he wants to use, you are absolutely significant. Next week, we're going to talk about Joshua. But you know, we're going to also talk about the guys whose names are not even mentioned. And I suspect that down the road, when, when the story uh, of Christianity at the end, at the beginning of the 21st century is written about Christianity here in Central Florida, there'll be some names but they probably won't be ours. That's okay. We get to fight the battles now. You get to fight the battles now because you are God's deeply beloved, redeemed sons who have the purpose of spreading the gospel. Your leaders, your worker providers, your warrior ambassadors, and you just fight the prolonged battle for the glory of God and the kingdom of Jesus in the here and now. Keep up the fight. Talk about it around your table. I'll get you out of here on time. All right, gentlemen, brothers in the great adventure, all right, well, I tell you, you never get the conversation, the conversations never get finished here, that we just keep carrying them on week after week, and that's the way it should be, there's always more to learn. Let's give it up for those who came for the first time today. Glad you came. Glad you came. And we sincerely hope we didn't run you off uh, and you'll come back and be with us again. So we're glad you're here and uh, appreciate you big time. Guys, the forge essentials mean these are absolutely crucial to what we do. Uh, inviting a friend or an enemy. Last week I met with the, uh, uh, our downtown Zoom group. Uh, we haven't opened up our downtown, but I met with the, them live, and uh, Jeff Patterson, who's our team leader down there, uh, brought a man that he's known for 35 years 
Mr. Burrell, who owns a shoe shop, a shoe shine company downtown. He's known him for 35 years. He looked at my boots and said, you need to see me. And, uh, and, um, but this 82-year-old gentleman knows the Bible better than I do. And uh, uh, when we talked about SeaWorld coming up and I was going to preach the gospel there, he, uh, I said, I'm not a celebrity. He goes, it's better, it's better to be a son than a celebrity. And I thought, oh, man. So you could bring a pagan or you could bring somebody who knows Jesus better than you and it can really encourage us all. We need uh, those men in our lives. Uh, by the way, if you are uh, available early on Sunday and would like to help us out, we need one guy. we got a team that's going down, but we need one guy that's willing to come down and help out at a, at a book table or something. And uh, so let us know, or Zach know, and uh, we appreciate that. But invite a friend, invite an enemy, and uh, your partnership means everything for us at Forge. It keeps us online, on the move, keeps us here, and all that. So we appreciate you big time. Truth, truth. Getting out of here, truth is a big deal. So uh, from this text today, we learned there will be deception, right? You ready for that as you go out of here? There will be deception. What will keep you from being deceived? Truth. Truth. Uh, there will be important decisions that have to be made. Can you make good decisions? What will help you make good decisions? Truth, prayer, godly men to give godly counsel to what you do, your fire team. Truth, yes. Uh, there will be battles over the long haul, right? What will keep you in the battles over the long haul? Truth, the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, and what you do and what I do every day, what keeps us from getting cynical, what keeps us from bailing out, is the power of God in our lives through the gospel and his truth. John, my friend at the back table back there, said about truth, he said, the only time to really establish yourself as a truthful person is when the truth is not popular. I like that, John. It's true. The truth is not popular now, and now is the time in the power of the Holy Spirit in the opportunities that you have to smile and sh sh it's time to go. I know. <laughs> now, if I were... at. At Forge, that means something because we do end on time. I've got 30 seconds. Um, your clock is fast. When, um, when the when alarm went off, when a pastor was preaching one time, he stopped and he said, you know what that means? And he said, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> I have no idea what I was talking about. The, the time... The time is now for us to be truthful. George Orwell, the writer of the book 1984, said this. He said, during times, listen, during times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And we have the revolutionary truth and you have the spirit of the living God that can enable you to winsomely look at people in the eye and tell them the truth. You do not have to change their minds. You do not have to change their hearts. All you do have to do is tell the truth and leave the transformation to the living God. But do be the teller of truth, no matter what the cost. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came into this world at this time. We thank you that you rode that donkey into Jerusalem proclaiming yourself the Messiah. We realize in this holy week where we celebrate your first coming that, Lord, you told us the truth and you were headed to the cross, that you came to die. You came to be rejected, 
to receive our curse that we could be set free for eternity. And so we pray for all of our churches and all of our pastors and all those that will preach the gospel and tell the truth of your first coming and how you are the way and the truth and the life and that no man comes to the Father but by you. And how we pray that even on Good Friday as we see it as good because you took our curse, we realize that even then on Good Friday, it was Friday but Sunday was coming. It was Friday, but Sunday was coming, and your resurrection from the grave showed that it was written, it is paid in full in your resurrection. And so I pray for my brothers that as they lead their families in this Holy Week celebration, as we experience your your first coming sacrificial death and resurrection, that we would be set free with resurrection power to tell the truth to those who need to hear. Give us love for those that we don't even know, the truth to empower and change lives. Be with us today, we pray, in your strong, powerful, and resurrected name. Lord Jesus, we pray, all God's men said, amen. Go get them, go get them.